Models of enzyme action. <coughs> enzymes have an, an active site. And here's, here's an illustration of an enzyme. And the active site is right in here. The active site is a relatively small part of the entire enzyme structure. But it is that little part that is actually involved in catalyzing the reaction. And it is three-dimensional in nature and it is formed by the other uh, parts of the protein chains that are brought together because of the secondary and tertiary structure of the protein. So, you know, this just looks like a bunch of little spheres kind of all jammed together. But that is one or more protein chains in which we've got all these amino acids linked together and then they fold it around on themselves. Remember the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets and then they've got the hydrogen bonds and different things that are holding them all twisted up on each other. And it, it forms this little region here called the active site. In order for the enzyme to catalyze something, the substrate has to come in. It's a little bit like a docking station. The, the enzyme substrate has to come in and attach at that active site. And when that happens, we call it an enzyme substrate complex. The substrate has to fit in there. Catalysts increase reaction rates by providing an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. So let's just do a quick review of catalysts. Um, what happens with with chemical reactions is a lot of times there's an activation energy. So here we're graphing um, energy increasing in the vertical. Here's your reactants, here's your products. And overall this reaction is energetically favorable because the products are lower in energy than the reactants. But in order for the reaction to occur we have to get up and over this hump. A little bit like those humps in the miniature golf greens, right? You have to hit your ball fast enough to get it up and over, and it doesn't always go over because it doesn't always have enough energy. What the catalyst does is it, it provides an alternative that's lower in energy, and so it lowers this activation energy hump so that it's easier for these to get over. Another analogy I've used is um, kindergartens students trying to climb over a fence. So here you've got, oh, we'll have a red fence, that's fine. So here you've got this fence, and you've got these little kindergartners, and they need to get to the other side of the fence. Well, it takes them a while to climb over the fence. A catalyst would be like having a teacher here, and she's picking the students up and lifting them over the fence. And so they're going to get over faster. The teacher doesn't get used up. She's still there, and it was just the one teacher, and she could catalyze many students getting over the fence. It's just a lower energy pathway, and so that's what a catalyst does. Any questions about catalysts? Did you talk about catalysts in your 3A class? Good. So there's different models of how enzymes do this. Um, one of them, which is the simplest and easiest to understand, is the lock and key model. And in this explanation, the active site is rigid. It has a specific geometrical conformation, and the substrate has to come in and fit in there perfectly. It's a little bit like a lock and a key. That's why they call it the lock and key model. So there's a lock on the door, and only certain keys will fit in. Other keys will not fit because it's rigid, it's hard, and it has to be just the right shape to fit in. This model explains the action of a lot of enzymes, but it doesn't explain the action of all enzymes. Um, another model is the induced fit, and this explains a lot more. Um, this allows that many enzymes have flexibility in their shapes. And if you think about that protein, with all those intermolecular forces that are holding it together. You can imagine that there's a little bit of wiggle room in there, a little bit of flexibility. It's not a, like a, a lock with tumblers in a specific shape. It's so, like a tooth and going 
A little bit like a tooth going into a gum. Um, the substrate will fit in here. Another molecule that, that doesn't have the right shape here will not fit there. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later. And what happens is the substrate comes in here and attaches to the active site. And, and when it is attached to the active site, it is easier for whatever reaction is going to occur to occur. It may cause a bend in the, in the substrate so that a bond can be broken more easily, or it may help to align two things that need to line up in order to react. There's all kinds of things that can happen. The induced fit model is more like a hand fitting into a glove. So a key going into a lock, the key has to be exactly right. But a glove Lots of different, slightly different hands could fit into the glove, right? And the glove changes shape a little bit as you put your hand into it. <coughs> and so that's what we refer to as the induced fit model, that the enzyme active site is going to change shape slightly as the substrate comes in. So here's a more specific illustration. So here's, imagine this purple windy line as the backbone of the protein chain. And then we've got these R groups, the side chains on those amino acids. And its, it's secondary and tertiary structure are because of interactions between the R groups, right, on, on the amino acids, those side chains. And the same sorts of interactions that hold the protein into a certain conformation are also what are going to attach the substrate to the active site. Do you remember what some of those interactions were? It's going to be on the test on Wednesday. One of them involves hydrogen. Are we talking about hydrogen bonding? Yeah, we're talking about intermolecular forces for the most part. So hydrogen bonding. Pardon me? Dipole-dipole interactions, the, the interactions between polar molecules. And then there were also interactions between nonpolar molecules. And then cysteine was kind of special. What happened with, what can happen between two cysteine molecules? The disulfide. Between the cysteine molecules, you can get the disulfide bond, which is actually a covalent bond. So here's some R group, and you've got a sulfur. And that can form a disulfide bond between two different side chains on, on cysteine, because cysteine has that sulfur group on it. So those are the same sorts of interactions that will interact with the substrate. The substrate has the right shape to come in here and have all these interactions line up. It might have a hydrogen bond over here and a nonpolar interaction over here and some polar interactions over there. Another substrate coming in where this doesn't line up to hydrogen bond, it's not going to fit. Or if you have something where the shape is such that it can't get into the crevices and, and bind with those side groups, then that's not going to fit either.